everybody. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. Um, Cindy and I will be presenting this special transcriptome spatial gene expression study in the human dorsolator of prefrontal cortex. And yeah. So as an introduction, the starting point, and as you know, the human brain has a spatial architecture that is closely linked to the brain function. And in this context, in particular, there's a laminar organization of a human cerebral cortex in which there are different cell type proportions with cells differing their gene expression patterns in their morphology, physiology, and connectivity with other cells. And that depends not only on the cell type itself, but also on the layer in which the cells reside because that determines the cellular environment and interactions and context with other cells. And identifying these cell type specific uh, proportions in the different layers is important because that enable us to establish functional links with brain development and disorders. And, and I say that because there are pathological changes and gene expression alterations that are associated with the specific brain regions and layers in the cerebral cortex. So if we are able to understand what's going on at the spatial level, then we can gain more insights, more refined insights into the C's mechanisms. Okay, so we are interested in spatial transcriptomics. One methodological important question is why to choose the PCM platform. So initially, single cell and single nucleus RNA seq technologies have gained popularity in recent years because they have they, they allow us to identify specific cell types by profiling the transcriptome of single cells or nuclei. But for when we want to use these technologies in the human brain, particularly for a single cell, the large size of the human brain makes it hard, in addition to the fragility of human neurons and the fact that most of the available postmodern human brain is frozen. So most of the available human brain data have been generated with single nucleus RNA seq technologies, which means this is an important fraction of the RNA that is the cytoplasmic one. Because one thing is that a gene is transcribing the nucleus, which is something we can capture with single nucleus RNA seq. The other thing would be that that transcript is correctly processed and then uh, exported to the cytoplasm and translated into a function of protein. That's something we cannot really um, explore with single nucleus. And of course, this technology is not, does not provide the special information needed. Then we have single molecule fluorescent in situ hybridization, as in fish, that those provide special information with these fluorescent signals for specific RNAs so that we can locate in which cell compartments they are concentrated or acting or existing. But again, there are some limitations, such as the limited multiplexing. Um, capacity of as in fish to interrogate. Ideally, we would like to interrogate them hundreds to thousands of RNAs. And even if that were something easy to do, there is molecular crowding of RNAs within the cell that will cause the overlap of the fluorescent signals. And again, the larger side of the human brain imposes a challenge, a challenge in addition with the lipofuscin autofluorescence that emerges from the human brain. Um, those represent additional computational challenges and also during microscopy operations. So, as in fish, provides spatial information, but not in a high truth manner. For that, the Tenex genomic species platform was developed, and it, it does capture the gene expression of intact tissue, also including the cytosol. It's a barcoding based transcriptomic wide spatial technology. In the following slide, here we have a very simplified uh, picture of how this PCM technology works. So we have PCM spatial gene expression slides, each with four capture areas. And in each that are around 5K barcoded spots. So the idea is that in, in each spot, the RNAs that fall within each will be captured with these oligos that have a poly detail for you to capture the polyadenylated mRNAs. And in addition to the unique molecule identifier, they are also tagged with a special barcode that is different within each spot. 
but all the RNAs that probably in a, in a specific spot are tagged with the same barcode. So in that way, we can trace the original location in which that RNA was um, existing. Um, we cannot really say this is single cell technology because in some cases, um, the spots capture more than one cell or even some of them are empty. For instance, in this study, there was an average of 3.3 cells per spot. 50% of them uh, contain a single cell body and around 10% of them lacked any cell bodies that were empty. Okay, so using these 10x genomics vision, vision platform, the objective of the study was to define the laminar topography of the gene expression, to define these genetic, these transcriptomic maps, and especially resolving a human DLPFC. And there are two main reasons why they choose this region, the brain. The first is because of this special architecture in cortical layers of the DLPFC. And the second is um, because it has been implicated in many neuropsychiatric disorders. So there's a clinical interest in studying this region. Okay, to do that, now moving to experimental design. It took two independent neurotypical adult donors. Uh, we can think of them as controls. They were not really um, presenting any disorder or they were not exposed to a substance or whatever. So they took tissue blocks of the LPFC from the brains of each donor, from the brain of each donor. These tissue blocks expand the six layers, from one to six, and also expanded to the white matter. Taking these tissue blocks, two pairs of spatial replicates were obtained per, per donor. There was a first pair of tissue sections of 10 micrometers, and those were two sections. And apart from that, another pair of two sections of 10 micrometers. So, um, in total, there were four replicates. You can think of these replicates as tissue samples. Totaling 12 samples that were run on the BCM platform. Okay, so moving to the analysis they perform and the results they obtain. The first they wanted to, to know, to confirm actually, was the spatial orientation of the samples. Because originally we have this, the tissue sections, these images, but we would like to verify that they are, sorry, they are especially um, orientated in this way. With the first layer at the, at the top, the sixth layer in the bottom, and the white matter in the um, bottom left in the corner. So to do that, they use gene markers for neurons, oligodendrocytes, and white matter in the fifth layer. For the neurons, they use SNAP25. And here in these spot plots, we can see here for the lab normalized counts in each spot. This is for just one sample, um, just uh, for an example, but they did it for all the 12 samples. And we can clearly see that the, this gene is highly expressed in this region compared to the white matter, right? And then taking this other gene, mob P, that marks the white matter and the oligodendrocytes, we can clearly see that it's highly expressed in the region that would correspond to the white matter. And the same thing for the fifth layer using this thing before. Yeah. Okay, uh, now I'm going to explain the layer of digital expression, uh, how, how is uh, how it's taken the procedure. Um, uh, here we have our different panels explaining the the process to, to get the, the matrix with the CAM pseudo bulkhead, and also a pair of uh, combinations that show the results in the statistical models that were tested. I'm going to start explaining the panel A. In the panel A, um, this is the histological tissue and uh, that Diane explained um, before. And also, um, this, uh, this tissue, uh, let's say that we have uh, this ground through uh, separation of the laminar, uh, each one of the layers. So this tissue is a uh, pseudo uh in order to, to have uh, these six layers, and we have at the end this uh, count matrix. Basically, it's summarizing uh, the U missing each layer in order to have these, uh, these matrix. Uh, when we have these, uh, 
these metrics uh, in the panel B, what we have is the PCA of each one of the layers. So we can see here uh, the variance between in the PCA one between the white matter and the and the gray matter and all and all the other layers. And in the PC two, what we can see is that there is some more, uh, uh, let's say the the difference between each one of the layers uh, that are described in the in the layers. For example, the layer one is here, layer two, three, four, uh, and five. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, we can distinguish uh, clearly the white matter in the PC one. So there is a uh, there were uh, there were um, a performer three different statistical models in order to to present the difference and validate the results. Can you go to the next slide, Diana? So as we can see here, uh, is that uh, the strategies to do this differential expression analysis using the layer information uh, was performed uh, with three models. The first one that is in the panel C is the ANOVA. And the ANOVA is an F statistical, an F statistic test. And what those is to analyze the variance between different uh, layers. So we can see here that one of the results that they get is that they have around 10,000 differential expression genes for the larger uh, for the larger six plus the white matter. Uh, but for example, also they have a eight thousand uh, excluding the white matter. So uh, in the panel D uh, is the other statistical model. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that all this uh, was tested with the gene MOPP. And the second model is the, the whole uh, layer rich model, and it's a T test. And in this T test, what is done is the uh, one specific layer is, um, is compared against all the others. So what they get is, um, uh, to mention an example, is 9,000 differential expression genes from white matter against the, for example, the other layers, and also can detect that the, the smaller difference, for example, is in the layer three. Um, the, the last model that was uh, performed is the called pairwise model. In this model, what is done is that each one of the layers is compared against the other layer. So uh, it means that, for example, the, 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 let's say the white matter layer is compared against the layer six, and then against the layer five, the layer four, the layer three, layer two, and one. So uh, this test is, uh, you, if you make the permutations, uh, it tests uh, 25 pairs, and they could detect uh, 8,500 differential expression genes for the fine matter. So as we can see, uh, we have uh, like similar similar results that can confirm the information that we can see in the in the in the cell so get data for the next one. Okay, um, so once they identify differentially expressed genes that are layer enriched genes in the schema, the LPFC with these three models, the next thing they wanted to, to know was if those genes were already reported as layer marker genes before in other studies or if they were new. So they took a set of previously identified layer marker genes from other studies and they test for the enrichment of such uh, previous marker genes among the differentially expressed genes that they found that were, were layer enriched. They did found a significant enrichment and testing for a, the differential expression of these previously identified layer marker genes, they found that um, a kind of an issue because some of these marker genes previously characterized were reported as markers for more than one layer. For instance, say, I don't know, say white matter and the sixth layer. So what they did was to feed optimal statistical models in which they compared expression of these cases, these genes for these cases, taking the expression in the layers defined, in which they were defined as marker genes against all the other layers. But even doing this, only 60% of these laminar marker genes that were already reported were significantly differentially expressed in the human DLPFC data. 
So this implies two things. The first is that they were able to confirm some of these canonical biomarker genes that were already new. And the second is that they identify previously uncharacterized laminar marker genes with potential um, implications to define the laming, the barriers in the human neopiopsy. They also validated this, these new marker genes with asin fish and by multiplexing with other known marker genes. So here, um, here we have the example of four of these layer marker genes. The first one, PAP B7, it was differentially expressed with the arrangement model. In the first layer, it, it was highly expressed compared again all all the other layers plus the white matter. And this is taking all the samples together, right, per box plot, and with this soda bulking process. And here in this spot plot, we can see an example for just one of the samples and the the expression of this gene, as we can see here in the orange and red spots, is more high in what we would expect to be the first layer. Then taking another example, PIVAL B, it was highly expressed in the first layer compared against all the other layers in the white matter. And taking this same tissue block as an example, we can see that it's more highly expressed here, where it is the fourth layer. Then there were other genes differentially expressed, same with the very wise model, like CCK, that was differentially expressed in the fifth layer against the white matter, something we can clearly see here, right? This is a fifth, the sixth layer against the white matter. So there's also high expression of this gene in the second layer. Then ENC1, it was highly expressed in the second layer against the white matter. So we can clearly see that, right? With the white matter. So yeah, basically they identify this new layer and reach genes and they confirm they were expressed in the layers in which they were differentially expressed. Okay, um, in this, uh, in this uh, figure, I'm going to explain the spatial registration uh, uh, validation and process that was performance. Um, the layer of Richard provides in the differential statistics differential expression statistics for the enriched model in revision data uh, is were used in this in this study uh, to, to perform a spatial register uh, for the single cell RNA seq data sets and the and add the layer enriched information to to data driven expression cluster that doesn't have the anatomical information. So in the panel A what we have is a uh, data that was taken from OCH. Uh, that we're using to confirm the layer enriched expression profiles. So these uh these uh, clusters that we see here in this T S N E plot were assigned to the different uh, layers. And then what was done is the uh, well in the in this uh, in this study, coach doesn't have uh the five matter layers. So that is why we we see here in the the x axis just uh the layer one to the layer six. And so the in, in this panel, the layer and which is differential expression for the spatially barcode for sections were in agreement, as we can see here in the time, you know, with the with the with the laminar assignment from with the nuclei what to write next. So here the layer one is an agreement with the layer one in the study, and layer two uh, is a, a bit more expanded, but it's in agreement too. A layer of uh, three, four, five, and, and until the six, because we don't have five matter in the whole story. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and in the layer C, um, in the panel C, sorry, uh, what we have is the layer and richer statistics. It was used to perform the statistical registration across uh, three independent data sets from the human cortex that Diana mentioned at the, at the beginning. So uh, what we can see here is that um, uh, they, they use here uh, a couple of, they, they reanalyze the information in order to confirm the results. If you go to the next slide, Diana. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the first, uh, in the first uh, confirmation, um, they use only uh, a couple of data sets, because in this one, 
when we're free analysis information but using Fourier, uh, the information uh, single nuclear analysis from Fourier donors across uh, around 70,000 nuclei obtaining from the prefrontal cortex across 44 blood clusters in a study that is related to the heavy disease. So uh, what you can see here is that um, it's to confirm the information that, for example, um, a, for example, the these glia cells, these subpopulations that we have in a more refined uh, resolution, show the expected results when uh, we we see a preferential expression uh, in the white matter layer for these uh, for these uh, subpopulations. And another confirmation that we can see here is the one that uh, was in the in Mati City Hall when we can see the subclasses that are associated with clinical traits that are preferentially uh, expressed in the excitatory neurons of uh, zero, four, and six. So we can see here expressed in the layer three and the layer two. Um, another confirmation that we can see is in the Belmesh et al. paper, when we can see um, astrocyte subpopulations that are associated with the layer one. So, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, kind of information, uh, we can also see that uh, uh, the, the methodology uh, was able to, to get um, a very refined resolution uh, for both excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the expect layers, according with previous studies. So we can see here, for example, the inhibitory subpopulations associated with the layer between the three, four, and five. And he kept also a couple of, of excitatory neurons uh, that are associated with the disease. Okay, so using this, so we, we they show the usefulness of identifying this layer and which statistics for special re registration. But of interest, it was also discuss the clinical relevance of this gene expression profiling um, and which for certain layers. Because as I told you at the beginning, there are several neuropsychiatric disorders that are specifically associated with molecularly defined cell types and brain regions. So to do that, they took sets of genes of neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric relevance and thus for their enrichment in different layers in the human DLPFC. So they took two different classes of clinical gene sets and generated this type of heat maps using one Cited, I think it was one sided fissure test to assess this enrichment. So they they test for the enrichment of the gene sets that are here defined in the x-axis among the differentially expressed genes that obtain in the human DLPFC that, that, that are layer enriched in each of these layers plus the white matter. The color of each cell represents the minus log 10 of the p-value for this enrichment. And the numbers are the odds ratio for the same enrichment. The cells without a number, they didn't present significant enrichment results. Okay, so first they were interested in seeding autism and spectrum disorders. They took initially the data sets, the gene sets of genes that were linked to autism by DNA profiling, because they contain genetic variants that were previously associated with autism disorder. So they found enrichment taking the first gene set of Safari. They found enrichment in the second layer, the fifth and sixth layer, and taking another set of 102 genes, they found enrichment in the second layer and the fifth layer. When they further separated these 102 genes into 53 genes, here are the second, the third gene set. These were 53 genes that were associated with dominant autism traits. They found, they refined the enrichment and map it just to the fifth layer and they're mining 49 um, genes of this set of 102. These were related to neurodevelopmental delay and they were enriched just in the second layer. So it was, I think, very interesting to see that when they divided the, the um, genes by clinical traits in which they are involved, we can see a separation of this of the enrichment in the layers when we take them, take them together. So that would mean they, they are a specific neuronal subclasses that are contributing to different clinical traits. 
even when we are studying the same psychiatric disorder, the autism spectrum disorder. Um, they also took a gene set of differentially expressed genes in postmodern human brain from patients with autism against neurotypical controls. They divided these differentially expressed genes in upregulated and downregulated, and they obtained these contrasting results in which upregulated genes were enriched in the first layer and the white matter, whereas the downregulated were enriched in layers three to six. So that would mean there are some layers that are more related with the upregulation of autism associated genes and other with the downregulation of these genes. Um, next, they will interest in schizophrenia, of course. So they took two large D sets. One was the PE, the second was uh, a study from the brain sake, BS. And the first day, they had these differentially expressed genes in schizophrenia patients versus controls. And again, for these two studies, they divided the, the, the genes in upregulated and downregulated. They found very consistent results for the upper-related genes, because in both studies, they found enrichment in the layer one, two, and three, right? And for the down-related genes in, in, P, in the PE study, they found enrichment in the fifth, sixth layer and in the white matter. And for the PS study, these genes were enriched in the fourth layer and the white matter. They also took genes that were associated with genetic risk for schizophrenia via TWOS, as we found wide association, association studies, but they didn't find significant enrichment results. So yeah, they just um, confirmed using this enrichment analysis with clinical gene sets that there is, there is a layer enrich uh, expression of several genes that confer risk to, to several brain disorders or that were differentially expressed genes in patients suffering these brain disorders. Okay, now for these, um, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, slide, I'm going to explain the data driven layer and rigid cluster in the source for that type of that context. So um, in the panel A, what we have uh, is the are, are present in, well, in general, are present in three alternatives for data driving approaches to classify these uh, these human spots into laminar uh, and not laminar patterns. Um, in contrast with the uh, with the supervised approach of identifying a large list in widget, uh, differential expression gene from manual annotation based on, on the CITO architecture. And so uh, what is shown here in the panel B, is that we can see that uh, federally it must be an identification and then uh, identify the clusters, make the clustering, make the confirmation of this clustering, and then compare uh, the clustering current against the against the information annotated. So it was a uh, more time consuming uh, methodology. Uh, to, to demonstrate this, uh, uh, they use uh, two different data sets. Uh, one, the first data set is uh, based in the in genes with high variable genes expressed in the in the two samples, and the second data set is uh, based in spatial variable genes uh, when there is no uh, laminar information uh, included. So, um, as we can see um, here in this in this uh, in this plot, what we are seeing is that the that that were uh, um, pick up. Uh, what was the was performed the statistical uh, model in order to to highlight um, uh, gene markers that uh, were uh, labeled as the laminar markers, for example, the MOPP and the PCP4 and the SNAP25 are considered uh, laminar markers that you can see here in the panel D that correspond to a specific uh, layer. For example, the MOPP. Is, uh, is uh, located in my matter. The PCP4 is located, I think, in the lower tree. Uh, and the SNAP25 uh, is, is a, like a marker, a uh, neural marker that is around the lower two, three, and four, I think. And, but also, uh, it's possible to identify non laminar markers like the HPV, 
the IGQC uh, and the MPI, when the, when the cell types are around all the tissue. So there is not a specific pattern uh, to follow. Uh, this can be, for example, blood cells or immune cells that are around all the tissue. Um, uh, another uh, highlight is the the uh, following, uh, when as, as has demonstrated here, following this uh, process uh, can be identified not only uh, laminar, uh, uh, laminar uh, genes or laminar patterns, but also non-laminar patterns. And the panel, uh, so in this panel is uh, like uh, comprised all the, the gene-wise test operations for conflicted information. Uh, in the next panel, the panel F, uh, can you go to the next slide, Tina? Okay. What is uh, shown here uh, is that uh, work uses uh, different implementations that cover the unsupervised, semi supervised, and using also gene markers um, to, to assign these patterns. So, uh, these are uh, different. These different implementations were compared against the semi-supervised approach that was guided for the layer enriched genes, and using um, in this case for the gene markers rather than human uh, markers from the world sank. What you can see here and in these in these uh, different panels is the performance of each one of these methods. So what we can see here in the first one uh, is um, the unsupervised methods, the semi-supervised methods, and, and the methods with the gene markers. They use a run index. The run index is based in, in mutual similarities. So uh, each one of these uh, box plots that we can see here are are the different data sets that were used. So we can see here, for example, uh, the disease in the in light blue, the spatial differential expressive the data set, and in the dark blue is the spatial differential expressive genes with the spatial information with the vision layer. So for the supervised methods, uh, most of the most of the uh, data set have a very similar performance unless the spatial information get a pretty more high. But what's very uh, notorious the the in the semi-supervised uh, methodology was uh, the highest, has the highest uh, Randall index against all the methods. Um, yes. So this is just to, to demonstrate that against all these methodologies implements, uh, what measures the performance and could be um, proved that in most of the cases, uh, the layer enriched, uh, the, the direct access that has the spatial information can have a better performance uh, using this uh, radar index. Okay, so just this uh, very brief discussion and the concluding remarks, we can say, that in summary, with this study, the authors were able to confirm previous single mucosarin seq derived player and reach expression signatures. They also increased the precision in the manual annotation of the clusters that were driving with these gene expression data to cortical laminae. And they also demonstrate, as I told you before, this layer and reach expression of autism, schizophrenia, risk genes, or differentially expressed genes. Um, yeah. and. This can be also used with other taking gene sets for all other neuropsychiatric disorders. They compare the manually annotated laminar clusters to the interallocated driving special clusters in the same human cortical tissue. And importantly, they provided all these data generated, the analysis tools, the results as a scientific as a tool, um, a bioconductor package. Um and yeah, to to they share this tool with all the neuroscience community. So I think that's a very important contribution. Uh, do you want to add something here, Cynthia? No, it's okay. I think that you cover all the points. Okay. Um, so that's everything we have for today. Thank you very much.